from West Virginia Public Broadcasting. Support for the legislature today is provided by the following. West Virginia University, online at wvu.edu. The High Technology Foundation, headquartered at the I-79 Technology Park in Fairmont, online at wvhtf.org. At the legislature today, yesterday's train derailment in Fayette County was the subject of two floor speeches in the Senate. One came with a stern reminder about water safety. And this year, West Virginia's legislature contains both a father-daughter and father-son team of lawmakers. We'll meet one pair tonight on the legislature today. Good evening, I'm Ashton Mara. In the House today, emotional debate over nursing home care. At issue was Senate Bill 6 relating to medical liability caps for nursing home administrators. The legislation puts a $250,000 cap on awards for non-economic damages to nursing homes, pharmacies and other facilities. The measure was up for passage. Liz McCormick reports. Last week, this bill stirred up a lot of controversy during a public hearing. Children and wives of nursing home residents feared the bill would give immunity to corporations in charge of nursing homes who might be involved in malpractice or fraudulent cases. Many shared their own stories of their loved ones dying in the care of nursing homes due to neglect and other acts. Speakers who were for the bill, however, said it would aid nursing homes that they claim are attacked by out-of-state trial lawyers who might be looking for a quick buck. Those arguments mirrored the ones on the House floor today. Delegate Tim Manchin spoke out against it. What this bill is about is protecting corporations, large business entities that are not rendering health care. They are making economic decisions. That's all they're doing. They are not listening to their local facilities. They're not listening to regional directors. They're making these decisions in a vacuum. Delegate Denise Campbell, also a Democrat, said she has worked in a nursing home for 14 years. She explained that many nursing homes are wrongly sued because people don't understand the rules the facilities have to follow. She held up the book of federal rules for nursing home care. That's one of the biggest uh, reasons nursing homes are, are sued is because of falls. Well, if you look in this book right here, this book will tell you that you cannot put any type of a restraint on anybody. Rather, they understand that it's dangerous for them to get up and walk. And you know what? If you even put an alarm on them that sounds that aggravates them, you can get a citation because you are psychologically restraining them, okay? I've had family members that come in and say, Denise, I do not want my mom to fall. I want you to put something on her that prevents her from getting up out of the chair or prevents her from getting out of the bed. You know what? I can't do that because that is a violation. I cannot restrict their movement. Rather, their movement is safe or unsafe, I have to allow them to be able to move. Delegate Kelly Sabonia, another supporter of the bill, says the legislation will bring West Virginia's health care system up to date and make it more modern. With lack of affordable and available liability insurance, we could potentially lose seven nursing homes in this state. We are back here today at the same place we were 12 years ago, and if we don't do something now, to reverse bad court decisions and clarify the intent of the legislature, elderly West Virginians will be placed in jeopardy. And keep in mind, West Virginia has the second oldest population in the nation. We have to have a place for our, our elderly population to go for care. People will drill oil where there is oil. They will dig gold where there is gold. And yes, out-of-state trial lawyers will scour our country coast to coast in search of plaintiffs or would-be plaintiffs in states where they stand to reap the largest jackpot. Senate Bill 6 gives predictability to those who insure our health care providers in order for them to offer available and affordable liability insurance. 
Delegate Stephen Skinner expressed his stance by telling a story of a woman who died while in the care of a nursing home in 2009. Let's take a look at what happened to Dorothy Douglas. Um, September 2009, Dorothy Douglas was admitted to Heartland Nursing Home here in Charleston. She was 87 and she suffered from Alzheimer's, but at the time that she was admitted, she could still walk with the aid of a walker. She was able to recognize her family and she was able to talk to them. After being in Heartland Nursing Home for 19 days, just 19 days, she become dehydrated, malnourished, bedridden, and barely responsive. She had fallen numerous times. She sustained head trauma and bruises and suffered from sores in her mouth and throat that required scraping away of, her dead, of the dead tissue. Um, she ended up at Cabell Huntington Hospital. And 18 days later, uh, she died as a result of severe dehydration. At the last, Delegate John Schott spoke for the bill and addressed Skinner's story. This certainly is a bill that's easy to generate emotion over. I don't think there's anyone here who hasn't had an experience with a loved one, a parent or a grandparent or uh, a close friend that has had, had to go to a nursing home. And I say had to go because that's normally not a choice that people readily make. But what I'd like to ask you to do is to uh, more or less disengage the emotional part of your, yourself, your heart, and engage your brain, and let's try to look at this in a logical and thoughtful manner, and balance all the, ish, all the interests, not just Dorothy Douglas, but all the interests that are involved in setting policy here in the state. And by saying that, I'm not trying to diminish uh, the, t the terrible situation that Ms. Douglas went through. I don't think anybody here would condone that. But it's so easy to let one horror story generate so much emotion that it overpowers your, 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 your ability to analyze and uh, understand what's at stake. If you balance all of these issues, if we're able to overcome one horror story, and it is horrible, believe me, it is horrible, our sound public policy would justify this bill, which represents a fair and reasonable balancing of all the interests that are involved in this situation. Senate Bill 6 passed 76 to 21, with Delegate Tom Fast the only Republican against the bill. For West Virginia Public Broadcasting, I'm Liz McCormick in the House. Senators today approved six pieces of legislation, including one that was reported back by a House and Senate conference committee. Senate Bill 13 was meant to reinstate the open and obvious hazard doctrine in West Virginia, a liability defense that was overturned by the state Supreme Court in 2013. Members of the House and Senate disagreed over whether a violation of state statute or ordinance could override the defense. The bill they ultimately agreed to today allows the courts to decide which prevails on a case-by-case -case basis. Senators also discussed an accident in Fayette County yesterday that caused a crude oil train to derail. As members of this body are aware, at approximately 1.30 yesterday, a CSX train carrying crude oil from North Dakota to Virginia derailed in the community of Adena Village in the Valley District of Fayette County. In response to this unfortunate situation, the governor undertook appropriate action to declare a state of emergency in Fayette and Kanawha counties as state and local responders made uh, resources available uh, to try to effectively deal with the consequences of this unfortunate incident. We can all be thankful that this incident resulted in no loss of life. As state and local emergency response officials continue their efforts to assist the residents of the Upper Kanawha Valley affected by this incident, it is my hope that we will continue to provide the resources and level of assistance required to effectively deal with this situation. 
As a legislative body, we should closely monitor the events of this incident in an effort to learn how we might make safer those communities and populated areas located along railroad routes throughout our state. In the meantime, Mr. President, I ask that we keep the affected citizens of the Upper Kanawha Valley in our thoughts and prayers. So the point I'm trying to make, and this is a follow-up of what happened just a month ago over in Lewisburg in Lewis County, again with the water contamination. And I don't think I have to remind anybody in this body what happened last year when the Elk River and the Freedom Industry spill that brought this capital and the, peak, the citizens, 300,000 people, to their knees because we had no water, couldn't shave, couldn't shower, couldn't bathe, couldn't drink it. So I know there's some bills that are moving through this legislature, both on this side and on that. And I ask, Mr. President, that all the members stay cognizant. We may have people, we may have coal, we may have oil and gas, we may have commerce, and we may have jobs. But the first thing we need is clean water. So whatever we do, I hope that we're mindful of the, of the significant role and the attraction and beauty and tourist dollars that it brings that nobody in this state, no industry wants to come here and locate if their kids are going to glow in the dark because the water they drink isn't safe, Mr. President. So I'm mindful of that. I know you folks are as well. I would hope we would pay particular attention to the health effects and the water quality of the waters of this state because it is absolutely imperative not only to our health but to our prosperity. Emergency responders initially reported crude oil was leaking into the Kanawha River from the crash site, causing West Virginia American Water to shut off their drinking water intakes in the Kanawha River that support the area. Now that the intense fire on the scene has subsided, state officials say none of the tankers actually reached the river. 26 cars derailed, 19 of those were involved in the fire. West Virginia American Water is in the process of restarting the Montgomery Water Plant, but a boil water advisory will be in effect. In a moment, we'll meet a father-son team at the legislature, but first, here's a look at some of the bills introduced in the Senate today. Among the bills introduced in the Senate today, Senate Bill 500, to provide a procedure for West Virginia to select delegates to an Article 5 convention for proposing amendments to the Constitution of the United States of America. And Senate Bill 501, to define midwife, certified midwife, and midwifery, and to require persons practicing midwifery in the state to make an annual report to the Bureau of Public Health. Up for passage in the Senate tomorrow, Senate Bill 266, the Governor's Bill to eliminate the consumer sales and service tax exemption on purchases of certain materials in the construction or maintenance of highways for the 2015 fiscal year. Senate Bill 277 to create Noah's Law. It requires the creation of a certificate of birth resulting in stillbirth. Senate Bill 286 relating to compulsory immunizations of students and allowing for a medical exemption. Senate Bill 421 to clarify when punitive damages may be awarded in civil actions and to limit the amount of punitive damages that may be awarded. The bill also requires that one-third of all punitive damages awards be paid to the state treasurer and deposited into the state's rainy day fund. And House Bill 2004 to require the legislature's approval of any state clean air plan that's required by the U.S. EPA under the Clean Air Act. On second reading in the Senate, Senate Bill 42, to allow restaurants, private clubs, and wineries to sell alcoholic beverages at 10 a.m. on Sundays. Senate Bill 294, the governor's bill to eliminate councils, committees, and boards that are unnecessary, inactive, or redundant. And Senate Bill 412, to establish a two-year time limit for filing complaints with a real estate commission for potential disciplinary action against a licensed real estate agent alleged to have engaged in unprofessional conduct. The first regular session of the 82nd Legislature is notable for a few reasons. By now you probably know it's the first session led by Republicans in more than eight decades. But did you know that this year one West Virginia delegate serves as the youngest in the nation's history at just 18? Or how about the state is being served by not just one, but two parent-child duos? Joining us this evening is one of those pairs. Delegate Ron Walters of Kanawha County was first elected to the House in 1992. He's the current House Banking and Insurance Committee Chair. 
His son, Senator Chris Walters, was elected in 2012 and serves as the Senate's Transportation Committee Chair. Gentlemen, thanks for being here tonight. Thanks for having us. Thanks for having us. So let's start by talking about the relationship between the two of you. I don't know for sure, but I would say if you're not the first father-son pair, you're probably one of the first. Delegate, what is it like having your son up at the legislature with you? Well, certainly I can get all my amendments passed, no problem. But, uh, you know, it's been a great experience. And he comes from a different generation. And I get the opportunity to share in his forward thinking. And he gets the opportunity, I hope, to share in, in some of the budget wisdom that I've had serving over the years. We talk often, as you would know, during the off year about things that are coming. But I'm really proud of what he's accomplished in the Senate and the fact is he's vice chair of finance over in the Senate in addition to chairing the committee. And, uh, and I'm looking forward to a number of years with him. Senator, did you feel pushed into politics? Did you feel like you needed to participate in politics? Or was it just an encouragement? Well, you know, my dad always has been supportive of me no matter what I wanted to do. You know, whether it be a political realm or where it be anything else, he just wanted to make sure I had a, a good foundation of an education. And he really pushed when I was young to make sure I had the education and the building blocks for me to be successful in life. I've always enjoyed politics because I've always enjoyed the fact that if there's an issue or if there's a problem, we can take that problem and try to find an opportunity for success. And that's essentially what we have here in the state. We have a lot of issues that we're looking at every day in that capital. And I like looking at those issues and trying to find opportunities to make West Virginia better. And by having the education that my father helped me achieve, you know, that gave me the ability to have the success I've had in the legislature. Delegate, you mentioned the generation gap, but does that ever cause any political differences? You know, it, it gives me the opportunity to think how someone much younger than I would thinks about a certain issue. And it gives him the opportunity, I think, to think how someone older thinks about a certain issue. So do we have differences? We have difference of thought in certain things, and we share and, and talk about that. And there's certainly compromise between where he is and where I'm at. De Senator, same mm -hmm. question. Do you run into political differences a lot? You know, we both look at issues different ways. Um, I think whatever, at the end of the day, the fact that we are open communication with each other, the fact that we talk about it from the experiences he has in his life, from the generational aspect that I have in mind, you know, I think that takes the whatever issue we're looking at and puts so many sets of uh, eyes on it from different areas that just makes both of our opinions better. You know, we both grow from it. We're both able to to look at it from, again, his years of experience, from the fact that I grew up in a generation that's always had a computer. You know, we look at all these different type of issues and and have two great different differing views, but not always differing opinions. I do want to talk about some of those bills. And Delegate, I'd like to start with a bill that you're sponsoring. That bill would require that five years after a rule is passed, the rulemaking committee would go back and review it. Do you want to tell us a little bit about that bill? Well, rules, of course, are regulations. They're passed by the different agencies or introduced by the different agencies, and they go through rulemaking review. We do not have a process currently of reviewing those rules after they go on the books. We literally have to rewrite a whole section of the code in order to bring it up to date. What this allows us to do is go in, take a look at that regulation. Is it doing what it's supposed to do? Is it economical? Is it too much burden for any industry, whether it's the government or, or private industry? We can fix it or we can get rid of it. It gives us the opportunity to go back and take a look. We've never done that in the past. Senator, there's a bill of yours that's coming up this week in the Senate Transportation Committee, and I'm assuming it'll move on after that, but that would the bill would build basically a broadband internet interstate is right. what you call it. You spoke about the bill last week on the Senate floor and actually before we talk about it I want to see a clip of that of that floor speech so sure. let's look at that. If you all haven't realized recently the federal government has increased its threshold of to what broadband actually is and how to define broadband. Currently it's now defined as 25 up and 3 down speeds. If you look at these maps that have been put onto your desks this shows the state of West Virginia and, and to make it simple Everywhere that is blue is not considered to have broadband access in West Virginia. To say that West Virginia is falling behind the nation in broadband connectivity would be an understatement. 
Just a year ago, Mr. President, we were rated 52nd behind Guam and Puerto Rico in broadband connectivity. After spending $42 million for last mile service, we've now raised our rating to 50th, still trailing just about every other state in the United States. So broadband access is an issue in West Virginia. That's right. How does this bill propose to fix it? Well, essentially one of the issues we have in West Virginia is First off, our connectivity. We still have a very, very poor rating as far as getting our residents connected. You know, as far as technology for the fiber, wires, everything going through our state, we're rated 51st behind American Samoa. So to say that we are behind the curve as far as technology in West Virginia, as I said in that speech, is a huge understatement. This bill builds an interstate throughout the entire state of West Virginia of fiber. It'll build 2,600 miles. I had a study done by West Virginia State University to see the economic impact of doing that. They predicted year one, after it was finished, creation of 4,000 new jobs, permanent jobs, and $900 million boost to our GDP. To put that into perspective, that's us spending $78 million for this interstate of fiber to create 4,000 jobs. We're delighted to have Procter & Gamble coming. They're an amazing company. They're spending half a billion dollars in creating 700. This will create 4,000 for less than 100 million. We're going to really get a great return on our investment. Delegate, a $78 million price tag. You've been around long enough to know that with a price tag that big, it's hard to convince people to do it. Yeah, we have multiple opportunities here to do it. One, we could do a bridge loan from the rainy day fund. And we could simply take the money that our school systems are paying for internet and pay it back over three years. Or we could take and allow the industry to do, issue a bond and let them fund it over a 30-year period and add it back into our rates. Very, very small amount of money. And there are multiple ways to go at this, but to spend $78 million to create 4,000 jobs mm -hmm. and $919 million of gross domestic product in one year is an amazing feat in West Virginia. Our gross domestic products, $46 million, or billion. This adds a 2% increase in one year. Think of the economic impact. From my generation looking at it, it is what we've needed to keep our kids here. It is the outside of the box thinking that moves us ahead in West Virginia and I'm blessed to have my son think of it. Senator, an example of a young person coming up with a new idea and trying to push the legislature toward it? To try to diversify our economy. You know, everyone talks about we need to diversify West Virginia's economy. We are stuck on these raw materials, and these raw materials have been great to us. But in diversifying our economy, there aren't so many people out there holding up new ideas with economic studies showing how they're going to do it. This is going to do it. This is going to give us the fastest, most affordable broadband connectivity in the United States. We'd be the first state ever to have all this built and paid for as infrastructure, not just looking at private companies doing it, but actually looking at broadband as infrastructure. It creates a whole new question, and the question is, is broadband infrastructure? And in West Virginia, we have to say yes in order to move forward and be the first state and the top leading state in broadband connectivity. A bill we're certainly going to watch. Senator Chris Walters, Delegate Ron Walters, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you, thank you for having us. Now here's a look at some of the bills introduced in the House today. Among the bills introduced in the House today, House Bill 2788, to require county boards of education to provide days prior to early voting during primary, general, and special elections for registering eligible students to vote and for the transportation of registered students to appropriate voting places during early voting periods. And House Bill 2795, to provide that when a party's health condition is at issue in a civil action, Medical records and releases for medical information may be requested and required without court order. The bill provides the right to object to the request for records. Up for passage in the House tomorrow, House Bill 2391 authorizes the State Board of Education to annually grant a waiver to a county board to implement a full-day early childhood education program that has children in attendance four days per week and uses the fifth day for staff training. House Bill 2523, to create a special revenue account to offset costs for the West Virginia State Police 100th anniversary in 2019. 
House Bill 2527, to create a task force on the prevention of sexual abuse of children. The task force is to develop recommendations and proposals for statutory changes, state education policy, and methods to foster cooperation among state agencies, local government, schools, and community efforts to prevent child sexual abuse in West Virginia. Among the bills on second reading, House Bill 2098, to authorize health care professionals practicing in federal veterans' affairs to provide services at state-run veterans' facilities without obtaining an authorization from the state. House Bill 2100, to permit hospital patients to designate a lay caregiver to provide aftercare assistance in the patient's residence rather than a licensed medical professional. And House Bill 2535, to require every public middle and high school administrator to provide opportunities to discuss suicide prevention awareness to all middle and high school students. The information must be approved by the State Board of Education. This has been the legislature today. Tomorrow we'll meet the chair and vice chair of the House Government Organization Committee. Delegate Gary Howell is the chairman from Mineral County and vice chair delegate Lynn Arvin from Raleigh County. We welcome your comments. You can email us at feedback at wvpublic.org. I'm Ashton Mara. Thanks for joining us. Good night. Support for the legislature today is provided by the following. West Virginia University. Online at wvu.edu. The High Technology Foundation, headquartered at the I-79 Technology Park in Fairmont. Online at wvhtf.org.